major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Wednesday, April 6th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. The calendar shows that it's spring, but the weather feels like summer. Record-breaking temperatures coupled with Santa Ana winds equals a warning from fire officials. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado visited Cal Fire headquarters and tells us they take these conditions seriously, and they say you should too. At Cal Fire San Diego headquarters, they're keeping an eye on the weather. Captain Neil Chapinski says they're expecting Santa Ana winds and it will be hotter than usual. It is rather warm today. Uh, this time of year, generally, we don't necessarily have uh, this type of heat coming through. Uh, this is a couple day wind event and uh, with some high heats, uh, high 90s, potentially triple digits. The National Weather Service has issued a heat advisory through Friday. Temperatures and Santa Ana winds will peak by Thursday. What's really unusual is not not having a Santa Ana wind, but is combining that with a very warm, hot air mass. Alex Tardy, a senior meteorologist with the National Weather Service, says temperatures will be 25 to 30 degrees above average. If we do get temperatures between 95 and 100, which looks definite, these are near record or at record levels. He says these singular events don't point to climate change on their own, but the data collected over time tells the story. All our recent years have been the top 10 warmest, so that's concerning. Plus, we're still in a severe drought. Captain Frank Lococo says these type of weather conditions create dangerous fire weather. When you get those high temperatures and those elevated wind speeds, it is like a blowtorch, so it's going to continue to dry out those fuels to increase the temperature of those fuels and the reality is after that happens the chance for a large scale scale catastrophic fire increases. Cal Fire is urging people to be mindful of the conditions and refrain from outdoor activities that can spark a fire. Maybe this uh, wind event, this heat event is not the appropriate time to try and do any uh, uh, mechanized equipment working around your house. If you do decide to do some of that, let's wait till the weather changes a little bit and it cools off a little bit. And you won't have to wait too long. Tardy says starting Saturday, things will begin to cool off. And by Tuesday, we could even see some much needed rain. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. Some important advice there. It's expected to get even hotter over the next few days, but a cool down could follow. Your full forecast is coming up in just a few minutes. Extreme weather is hitting much of the country with high winds, rain, and even some snow. Deadly thunderstorms and tornadoes hit the south yesterday, including near Savannah, Georgia. A few hours inland, there was even more destruction. And near Dallas, Texas, four people had to be rescued after a flash flood. Forecasters are warning of more dangerous weather in the south this week. The U.S. is rolling out new sanctions on Russia, this time going after Putin's adult daughters and banking institutions. European allies are in support. This as NATO acknowledges Russia's attack on Ukraine could last for months, even years. More now from reporter Karen Kefa. Amid more startling images from Ukraine. Responsible nations have to come together to hold these perpetrators accountable. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland says the Justice Department is helping to collect evidence for possible Russian war crimes prosecution. The United States is, at the request of the Ukrainian prosecutor, assisting in the collection of information with respect to the atrocities that took place. Garland announced a number of U.S. actions, including charges against a Russian oligarch for sanctions violations and the disruption of a botnet controlled by Russia's military intelligence agency. This as the White House joined European allies in imposing new economic sanctions on Russian financial institutions and on Russian President Vladimir Putin's two daughters. But at a NATO summit in Brussels, an acknowledgement the conflict could last months, even years. We have seen no indication that uh, President Putin has has changed his ambition.
mission to control uh, the whole of Ukraine. But at the same time, we have to be realistic and, and realize that this may last for a long time. On Capitol Hill, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned of the economic toll of a long Russia-Ukraine war with its disruption of the global food and energy markets. The EU took its first steps towards sanctioning Russia's energy market this week with a proposal to ban coal imports. In Washington, Karen Kafa, KPBS News. Last week, the FDA expanded the emergency use authorization of two COVID vaccines so people 50 and older could get a second booster shot. Now the question turns to those under the age of 50. Today, FDA advisors met to discuss that question as well as variant-specific boosters and whether or not the vaccine will become an annual shot. However, they did not reach any conclusions. Also today, UC San Diego joined a clinical trial on the potential benefits of additional booster shots. There will be a runoff in the special election to fill the remaining months of former Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez's term. KPBS Speak City Heights reporter Jacob Ayer has a look at the results so far and what comes next. After Tuesday's special election for California's 80th Assembly District, the two Democrats in the race, David Alvarez and Georgia Gomez, are neck and neck. With neither candidate getting the 50% plus one threshold to win the seat outright on Tuesday, the two top vote getting candidates are headed to a runoff election on June 7th. KPBS spoke with Alvarez outside of his home in Barrio Logan today. As of latest tally, he leads Gomez by just 491 votes. I feel really good about where we ended. You know, uh, the other campaigns were saying that we might not even make it into the runoff. So to come in first is definitely a, a boost uh, of energy and excitement. But, you know, now we have two more months to talk to more voters. So far, over 34,400 votes have been counted in the race, with 6,500 still to be added on Thursday after 5 p.m. KPBS also spoke with Gomez today at the Mercado del Barrio in Barrio Logan. And I'm just very excited. I'm very tired. Um, very, uh, just everything in between in terms of feelings. But it's just, it's, it's good. It's good to be where we are. Um, we only think that it's going to get even better um, as the, the continuation of the count continues to move forward. And I'm looking forward to, to June 7th. The runoff special election on June 7th also coincides with the regular election primary for the same role. That can make things confusing for some voters, according to San Diego County Registrar of Voters, Cynthia Paz. This special vacancy election is to fill for the fill the seat for the remainder of the term, so through December of this year. Um, the new term will start January of next year, so that will be on the ballot in June for the full term. The Registrar of Voters says there will be another update on the vote on Thursday, and the election will be certified on April 14th. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. And of course, we're following all the latest on the special election at kpbs.org. Just click on the special election banner right there on our homepage. San Diego rideshare drivers are calling for safer working conditions and more support from companies like Uber and Lyft. Today, they joined a caravan that ended at Uber's Mira Mesa hub. The drivers say ride-sharing companies offer little support to workers who are attacked or injured on the job. They don't give us any tools or anything we can do if someone decides they're going to attack the driver. They don't even take their full name. They don't even do the registration with their proper ID. So, and then if there is an incident, we don't even, they won't give us the name so we can do a police report. We, we're stuck. The union rideshare drivers United read out the names of 50 drivers who have been killed nationwide in the last five years. In a statement, Uber says these incidents are a horrific tragedy, but that there have been spikes in crime and violence across the country and they aren't immune. The company says they have insurance programs to support families and are working on tech to improve driver safety. A Lyft spokesperson echoed that, saying the company is committed to protecting drivers from crime. San Diego transportation officials are dealing with backlash against new bike lanes in Mira Mesa. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says drivers are finding the design confusing. If you go on next door, 
Uh, there's two words you keep seeing, stupid and ridiculous. Gary Sharp lives in Mira Mesa on a street near the new bike lanes on a quarter mile stretch of Gold Coast Drive. Simply put, he's not a fan. If it's on this street, is it going to be on the next street and the next street and my street? Won't be happy. Totally unsafe, stupid and ridiculous. I took the bike lanes for a spin myself. They're called advisory bike lanes, and while they're new to San Diego, they've existed in other cities and countries for decades. They're generally used on streets with low traffic volumes that are too narrow for conventional bike lanes. There's no center dividing line. Motorists in both directions have to share a single lane and can veer into the bike lane when another car approaches. On a street like Gold Coast Drive, they offer cyclists their own dedicated space with no loss of street parking. It's so new that we needed education. Nicole Burgess is a cycling advocate from Point Loma, where city officials are planning to paint advisory bike lanes on Evergreen Street. Burgess says the city should have done better outreach and education on how to use advisory bike lanes. But she doesn't agree they're unsafe. If anything, she says, drivers who are confused by the street design will slow down and be more alert. As soon as the street is slurry sealed and you have a double yellow line, those cars are flying as fast as they can and on autopilot, right? So they're not paying attention to their surroundings, and this makes people pay attention to their surroundings. 2021 was the deadliest year for cyclists in recent memory, and Gold Coast Drive wasn't exactly safe before the bike lanes. It's seen 72 collisions since 2015. Those crashes injured 38 people. Still, the backlash in Mira Mesa caught the attention of Mayor Todd Gloria. This week, he decided to put plans for more advisory bike lanes on hold, pending a public outreach campaign. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Don't expect big oil to help lower prices at the pump anytime soon. CEOs from Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, BP, Shell, and other energy companies told lawmakers they would not reduce dividends or share buybacks. Those are strategies designed to keep stock values high for shareholders. Democrats in Congress are calling on them to put money into increasing production instead. The CEOs blame shortages in labor and equipment for keeping production lower than it could be. Trouble for the San Diego County Fair just two months before it's set to open. A court ruled that the contract awarded to the Carnival Rides operator was invalid. The judge found there was enough evidence to suggest that the bidding process was rigged to favor Ray Kamak shows, or RCS. And in response, Texas-based Tally Amusements filed a lawsuit. Their lawyer says the upcoming event should include Tally. They're going to have to make other arrangements to do that um, you know we believe that in good conscience those arrangements should include tally amusements since we actually won the contract um, but the fair is now going to have to sit down and decide what they're going to do fair officials say they are considering all options and will have a decision in the coming days the fair is scheduled to open on june 8th Get ready for a big time warm up here across Southern California and really much of the western part of the nation here as we move through the next uh, several days. It'll be near record warm here for some. Gusty winds picking up too and then we have a powerful storm that puts an end to the warm up as we head into next week. So let's talk first about some of the wind advisories in effect here mainly in the inland areas extending up into some of the mountains. Wind advisories remain in effect here through 4 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. Also we have already heat advisories that have been posted. These remain in effect through 6 p.m. on Friday. So this just goes to show you how warm it's going to be getting here over the next couple of days. Temperatures tonight getting down into the low 50s in Oceanside, mid 50s in Ramona, low 60s for you out towards Borrego Springs. And then as we head into the day tomorrow, we're already in the upper 80s in Oceanside, upper 80s in San Diego. We're closer to 100 degrees in El Cajon, 90s on the board for you in Borrego Springs. 
things. And the heat continues to build from Thursday into Friday. There's also going to be an increasing fire threat with just how dry it is. And again, the heat building on in and the gusty winds, an increase in energy demands and also heat related illnesses uh, risk will also be a concern here to close out the work week. Near the coast, temperatures going to likely uh, peak there for you on Thursday in the upper 80s, mid 80s on Friday, and then we'll already start to cool off as we head towards your Saturday. We're back in the 70s and even cooler towards Sunday and Monday with that marine layer really increasing and getting stronger, bringing a little bit more cloud cover in the forecast there for Monday. Further inland, temperatures go from the mid to upper 90s Thursday and Friday back into the 80s, Saturday, 70s, Sunday, 60s. By the time we get to Monday, so a dramatic drop here on the way in the mountains going from the mid to upper 60s down into the low 50s as we look ahead towards Sunday and Monday. And in the deserts, temperatures here going from the 90s back into the upper 80s on Sunday. And we get back down to about 80 degrees as we head into next Monday. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Jessica Pash. The conservation group Sea Shepherd says a new partnership with the Mexican Navy has reduced the number of fishing boats in the sole habitat of the endangered vaquita porpoise. Vaquitas live only in Mexico's Sea of Cortez, and a recent survey show an estimated eight adults and one to two calves are believed to exist. Pritam Singh is board chairman of Sea Shepherd, and he said that while working with the Mexican Navy, they have reduced the number of panga fishing boats in a critical area from more than 50 to less than four. I think it's because of the process that's taking place out there with our being present and our reporting to the Mexican uh, Marine and they're then promptly responding. So the Pungas know that if they come into the ZTA, we'll know it, we'll see them, we'll report them, and the Navy will respond. The use of gill nets to catch fish in the Sea of Cortez has trapped and killed vaquitas for many years. Sea Shepherd and the Navy have created a zero tolerance area within which such fishing is banned. I'm Judy Woodruff tonight on the news. Our Western nations impose new sanctions on Russia in response to the atrocities revealed in Ukraine. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. April marks the month in which we focus on autism awareness. Advocates say there should be a spotlight shining on autism acceptance as well. Mandy Gaither has more. Approximately one in 44 children in the U.S. is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder or ASD according to the latest estimates from the CDC. ASD begins at a young age and can last throughout a person's life. You're really likely given that most people with autism have jobs, live in our community, go to our same schools. Um, you're very likely to know people with autism. Katie Walton, director of Ohio State University Nysonger Early Learning Program, says the focus is shifting away from autism awareness and toward autism acceptance. I think that now we think of autism I'm much more as a piece of neurological diversity. We know that people come in physically in all shapes and sizes, and we're realizing that people come neurologically in all shapes and sizes too. The CDC says ASD is a developmental disability caused by differences in the brain. It can be a genetic difference, but other causes aren't yet known. People with ASD may act and interact, communicate and learn differently compared to others. Different does not have to mean bad. Um, people with autism are different um, in many ways for, uh, from other people, um, but certainly not in all ways. And I think the key is um, different, not less. Walton says the push to accept differences should last all year. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Rady Children's Hospital is honoring those who've changed the lives of young people by donating a kidney. Today's celebration was part of Living Donor Day and kicks off National Donate Life Month. Over the past two years, surgeons at Rady Children's performed 11 kidney transplants. During the ceremony, each recipient and donor received a medal from their nurses and doctors. Some of the young patients waited months and even years on the transplant list. And dialysis is very rough on kids. It really impacts their life and their future. And what this donation does is it gives them hope. It gives them a future, an ability for them to look forward for years to come. 
Rady Children said there are currently 23 young patients on the kidney waiting list in San Diego County. Tomorrow night, the studio door in Hillcrest will open its new exhibit. It showcases artwork about climate change from young people who consider themselves artivists. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando explains how two doctors came up with the idea. Dr. V. Nguyen, a.k.a. Dr. Plastic Picker, calls herself a secret eco-warrior trying to save the earth one piece of ocean-bound plastic at a time. So I'm a pediatrician. Um, I'm a climate change and health advocate. And so the most important thing to me is to let the world know that climate change is a, public, is a pediatric public health crisis. I wake up every day and think to myself, how can I help stop this and how can I bend the arc? toward a sustainable future. And so it seemed crazy, but one of the simple things that a child can do is actually draw a picture. I used marker and I came up with this idea because a lot of people, they dump like their waste into the ocean. So then I made the ocean black like it was oil. And in the whale, it's a lot of other sort of plastic trash and like stuff that's just bad for animals. But then when it comes out of the black water, the colors change from gray to a brighter like blue that makes it seem more alive in a sense. Looking at climate change through youthful eyes is at the heart of hashtag we borrow the earth from our children at the studio door. C. Photo Rianu is an artist, but his patients know him as Dr. Andre Photo Rianu. We thought that it's a good idea to involve the children into, you know, creating art and uh, creating some experience, uh, positive experience about uh, how to think about um, nature and environment and become a better, better citizens in this world. Maya Satterberg is trying to be one of those better citizens. The 17-year-old Mission Bay High School student had her water-themed painting selected for the exhibit. I just portrayed everyone's collective need um, for water and perhaps the ways we are affecting it and I've obviously surrounded the whole piece by um, making waves next to it to show how like every aspect is being affected by climate change. Making waves is exactly what the artists and organizers want the show to do. I think that art is such a useful and powerful tool to convey any sort of messages. So any visual communications is what I'm mostly interested in. And I think it's so interesting to see what everyone else has come up with as well. Fellow artist Michelle Yu is a 12-year-old Oak Valley Middle School student concerned with ocean pollution. I'm really interested in animals. And a lot of the animals that I like, they're slowly going extinct because of like the changing climate and a lot of trash that we um, dump into their environments. Pediatricians like Nguyen and Fotorianu witness firsthand how climate change is impacting children. We see asthma more, we see obesity, we see depression, anxiety. I mean, we can only be healthy in a healthy environment and health, healthy nature. So uh, it's all connected. Um, the reason I become a pediatrician is to change things from the start. And so these problems that we see in pediatrics, obesity, plummeting child mental health, it's all connected to the climate. And so when you realize the intersection of climate and health and children and the earth, it just opens the doors and makes us be more creative to kind of deal with these medical problems that kids have. Hashtag we borrow the earth from our children lets students express simple, clear messages. Children understand fundamentally what we adults make way too complicated. I think you really have to realize that it's an existential crisis. There's no time left. We have to act now. Art can help convey that message. It can also enrich a student's life. Not only does it promote like critical thinking and like critically engaging with the topics that you're making artwork of because you have to understand a concept to break it down and then visually communicate it to an audience. But I think also art actually does have a very great transformative power because it allows people to critically engage with the ideas that are being presented. You can engage with the art of both students and professional artists at the studio door with hashtag we borrow the earth from our children. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. An opening night, two years in the making. A nonprofit theater company is staging their first production since the pandemic. KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne gives us a sneak peek. Luminary Arts caught the keys to their first studio in February of 2020. Everything just came to a complete standstill when the pandemic hit and we weren't sure what we were going to do at first. <laughs> Amy Throckmorton with Luminary Arts said the group had to get creative in order to keep the arts alive 
and make rent on the newly leased space. Even though we were hemorrhaging money because we had just rented this enormous space that we wanted to do whatever we could to keep it going. So we had to learn all these brand new skills. We started doing online classes, Zoom classes, Zoom shows, uh, and it was a, a big learning curve. She says federal paycheck protection program loans and teaching contracts with some North County schools kept them afloat. And now that COVID restrictions have eased, the artists have finally gotten use of the new space to prepare for their performance of 13, the musical. It is a full length show and it's our very first full length show in a theater that we've been able to do since the pandemic hit. And I'm just so excited. The kids have been working so hard. 13 is a musical about growing up and was the first Broadway musical to have a full teenage cast. Luminary Arts is doing the same. Here's some of the cast. I'm very excited and I know that a lot of other people are very excited because this is like the first like big full length musical that they've done. I'm really excited to be back in a real indoor theater. This is my first time playing in the pit and I'm really excited. Super exciting to get to do it with a cast full of people who I have gotten such a close bond with and like it's just real fun. <laughs> Tonight is opening night for the show, and it runs until Saturday at the Avo Theater in Vista. While it took almost two years to get in front of an audience, Throckmorton says the pandemic did have a silver lining. We also still are offering online classes for people who are more comfortable with that. Luminary Arts continues teaching at some school districts still holding virtual learning, bringing the arts right into their screen. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Good night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.